Yeah, I asked Gregory not to uh, introduce me because I have my own slide. I didn't want to do it twice. Um, the thing I'd like to just say is I'm a, a Mizzou alum, a uh, native of Missouri. Grew up in a little town called Bowling Green, Missouri. High school in St. Charles area. Got an electrical engineering degree here four decades ago uh, before computers were really uh, a household item. So I've been in the computer industry most of my life. Um, right after I left, uh, right after I graduated, I spent 12 years in Texas, and then I started my first company there. A company in California bought us in 1990. They made me move to California, so I had to move to Santa Cruz, California. I lived out in Silicon Valley for 25 years, and then I came back four years ago. So um, I've had a, a very rewarding career, first at TI, and then later, um, at other places. Uh, my big claim to fame is in the early days of the internet, 1994. I joined a company called Netscape and we had the original browser and we did an IPO in 95, uh, $3 billion. So that was the company that basically started the whole dot com thing. I really enjoyed our speaker last night talking about CRISPR and all the changes that's going to make. And I think what the internet was. 30 years ago, CRISPR and things like that is going to be now. So I think we're at another very interesting time where there's going to be a sea change in the way we do a lot of uh, biologics and new drugs. Um, a couple other fun facts. Uh, while I was in California, I learned how to sail. And so five times I sailed from California to Hawaii. Uh, one time I actually won the race. And then I got to hang out with James Cameron. In 2005, he showed me uh, this thing called Avatar. I had a hard time understanding what these blue people were doing and all. But he also showed me a thing called Alita. And that's coming out to theaters uh, like in a couple weeks now. So I first saw that when Jim showed it to me in uh, 2005. I came back four years ago. The idea was I had a lot of experience in industry, I had a lot of experience starting companies, and I came back with the express intent of sharing that experience and helping people around Missouri start companies, uh, particularly here at the university. Uh, while I was in California, I actually worked at one of the big venture capital firms, so I got a little uh, taste of how VC works. And so after I got here, I started a $2 million fund to fund really early stage companies here, one of which is in the room. Peter Sharp has a company called Envision Ag, and we funded that to help him uh, roll that out and get it used across America. Uh, he's one of 17, actually 19 companies that we funded now. Uh, I have a class in the College of Business. I teach on investing in startups. And I've taught probably 100 students so far how to do venture investing. I love working with students. That's very rewarding. And then my other thing I'm working on now is a hyperloop between St. Louis and Kansas City with a stop in Columbia. Uh, very soon now, we're going to be rolling out a feasibility study that Black & Veatch has done that talks about it's really commercially viable to do. They're not that hard to make. It's just a big vacuum tube. Um, and then we got to figure out what the next steps are on, on that project. So um, this slide is kind of a review. A lot of people wonder, why are we so excited about startups? What, why does a university even have to do startups? And here's my explanation for that. So I'm going to start over here on the corporate world side. Over the last. 15, 20 years, corporations have been outsourcing more and more their R&D efforts. So fairly recently, Novartis paid $4 billion for a drug that helps cure uh, pancreatic cancer. The radioactive payload for that drug is actually made here in Columbia in our reactor. And the radio ligand that targets the uh, pancreatic cancer was developed in St. Louis. It made its way through a company in Switzerland, and that, they're the guys that got the $4 billion. But the CEO of Novartis and many other drug companies and many big ag companies have decided it's better for them 
to pay a lot of money for a known good product in a startup than it is to fund a bunch of research themselves that may or may not make it to the market. So that's not something the university's asked for, but that's the way the world around us has changed. And so where we used to be able to license pretty basic patents, and then industry would take it, and they would do the R&D, now we have to fill the gap with a startup because industry won't buy the patents from us, the basic patents anymore, unless we've done some development on it. So the preferred vehicle to get stuff from a university to an industry partner nowadays often involves a startup company. And that's not always true. Uh, the big motor companies and airline, uh, airframe companies, Boeing, they still do stuff in-house. We can patent stuff, to, we can license patents to them. But many, many other industries are being run by chief executives and shareholders who want that instant gain. The day they announce that they're buying a company, their stock goes up. So that's the world we live in. So it behooves us to figure out how we can get the basic technologies that we're doing through this process. And it's not a process universities have done traditionally, but us and many other universities uh, are now, it behooves us to figure out how to do this. So one of the steps along the way is what I'm going to primarily talk about is a lot of universities have an incubator. Um, the incubator here at Missouri is run by a thing called the Missouri Innovation Center. And when I came back four years ago, uh, I came to manage that organization. It's a separate 503C corporation or a nonprofit. It's been around since 1984 doing various aspects of this uh, ecosystem building. Uh, it's got a board of directors, as nonprofits do, you go with a huge board of directors that can help you raise money. It's almost half university people, so the, the dean of the medical school, nursing school, engineering, business, et cetera, are on the board. And then we have people from the community, from the business community, are also on the board. And it's kind of a halfway house, if you will, between the university and corporate world. Uh, we're one of 10 innovation centers around the state, uh, funded by state, uh, by the Missouri Technology Corporation. Uh, the others are typically around college and universities as well. Uh, we have an, a very good partnership affiliation with the University of Missouri. We have a contract where we run the operator, sorry, the incubator. We operate it for the university. They don't pay us anything. We do it by getting our government grants and collecting rent. Um, and that, we've been doing that for the last eight years. Um, and we work, in addition with university startups, we work with others from around the state and the, in the area. Our part in the food chain is we work on technology-based startups. So we don't do restaurants, we don't do laundromats, we just do technology-based. But that's why we're a great pairing with a great university, a research university like University of Missouri, where we have a lot of technology, and now we're trying to figure out how to get it into startups. So the way it works, uh, first I'll tell a funny story. Uh, soon after I got here, I met a lady at church, and she says, I drive by that incubator on Providence Road every day. I was wondering, what are you guys doing there? Do you incubate chickens, or what are you doing there? And she sort of had it right. It's like an incubator, and that's why we call it an incubator. But instead of chickens, it's uh, young companies that we help incubate. And so we try to create a nice environment, sorry, for the entrepreneur, the founder, team, the scientist, wh whoever it is. It's, but it's like an incubator. We put them in a nice, warm place where they have everything they need and they can grow and mature until they can live on their own. So uh, a lot of people come down to the incubator because they need money. So we have an affiliation with Centennial Investors here in town, which are our angel group. We know the uh, big VC firms in San Francisco, sorry, uh, St. Louis, and Kansas City, and so we can help with that. We, uh, we write letters of support for grant proposals, for SBIRs, 
We actually have a grant writer who's there who can help you write your grants. So we have a lot of support there. We have, obviously, the space. We have wet labs, uh, BSL-2 labs, where people with life science, uh, medical devices, et cetera, can do their work. Uh, one company just moved in, and they're making a stint to go in hard, and it, it employs a nano coating instead of a drug coating to prevent uh, things from depositing in the stint. Um, we provide a lot of coaching and mentoring, uh, and we do a lot of introductions. Many times, the entrepreneur uh, needs a business person, needs a salesperson, or whatever, and we try to help make all those matches. So again, the idea is the entrepreneur can come to the incubator. They're outside of their university lab for conflict of interest purposes. Uh, they have their own equipment there. And that's where they can work on developing their company separately from the university. So the typical engagement, this is uh, chronology here. It starts almost always in a university research lab on a project. The uh, inventor invents something interesting. They file the disclosure with the university. And the university, if it th they think it's a good idea, they patent it. And so Sam Bish uh, runs the tech transfer office here. And they're up. And step two happens at the university. Often, or sometimes, the people involved, the faculty person or uh, other people involved in the research, will say, hey, I think there's a company I want to start here. And if they've got credible skills at that, then the, we'll license that technology to the company. So step uh, five is the inventor licensed their patent back from the university for use in their company. That seems odd to a lot of people, but trust me, that's the way it has to work. Um, once you have the patent, then you can uh, typically go out and raise money because that patent is in valuable intellectual property. And based on the presence of that and the ability to prevent other people from practicing it, that's often what you got that you can then raise money on from Centennial investors. Uh, you use that money to develop your initial product, start going through the regulatory process for whatever it is that you do. And uh, once you become successful, you get revenue, then you move out of the, move out of the incubator into your own space. So that's the general flow of almost all the companies, at least the life science companies that come through. And you've, you've heard a lot about elemental enzymes. You're going to hear more about them later. Brian and Katie are both here. But they're one of our better, most recent success stories. And we're so uh, happy for them. And uh, congratulations for everything they've done. But basically, they went through this process. They, they invented the technology here in the Bond Center. Brian and Katie, I don't know how they decided, but eventually decided, hey, we think there's something here. We want to start a company. So fairly soon in that process, they moved into the incubator, got space there, raised a half a million dollars, I think, was the first round. And they were off to the races. So they've now licensed to multiple companies, including Bear Crop Science, uh, multiple technologies that they're doing. So I'm not going to steal their thunder. But uh, how many employees do you have now? 31-ish, yeah. So anyway, they're a huge success. Uh, and it shows how the, the scientists here at the Life Science Center can work with the, you know, the business people at the incubator center. Monsanto's name is in both places, so that's a common thing. Um, we have a pretty long list, though, of others that have come through the incubator. Uh, some longer ago, like Modern Meadow, was moved out before I even got there. Uh, they've raised, I think, $40 million or so at this point and uh, moved to New York. Uh, let's see, a couple more. Uh, several of these have raised $5 million or more. Uh, Eternogen, I know, raised probably seven or eight million. 
Uh, intensive controls is raised probably five million. Um, North Star, the one next to the bottom there, they moved about 20 people down here from Wisconsin and are working on a new imaging agent uh, in association with the reactor. So it's a lot of interesting things. Most of these are University of Missouri technologies. Uh, intensive controls moved here from North Carolina Research Triangle. Uh, Cancer Research Center was already here in Columbia. We've actually had some like AgBiTech move here from other countries. So AgBiTech started their North American headquarters here. They're an Australian company. So it's a variety of different things, uh, but they all have a common thing that they're technology based, early stage, and they need the mentoring. And in a lot of cases, they needed the wet labs. This is a uh, schematic of our facility. At Providence Road would be over there on the right. Um, there's a pretty long wing that comes back, and it's wet labs on the left side, dry labs on the right side. I'm happy to say we're 100% full on the wet labs now. We're starting a waiting list again and we're probably 70, 80% full on the dry lab space, which is good. So um, we're having a good year. Uh, there's been discussion to actually build an extension on, which would be this piece here. This is the existing building. And we could uh, triple our amount of wet space there. This is a $15 million project, so right now is not a good budget climate for that. So we've kind of put that on hold. But over time, as we have more and more demand for spin-outs from the university, uh, the incubator could be a limiting factor in that at some point if we don't, if we we're still 100% full. Uh, I have a little time left, and then we actually, I think, can go over a little. I wanted to leave with this thought. So when I lived in California, um, I lived in Santa Cruz, which is where surfing, a lot of surfing there. Um, so I went to some surf contests, and the way it works is the surfers go out and they wear these different colored jerseys, and the judges on shore can tell who's who by the jerseys, and they get a time period of like 20 minutes, and during the 20 minutes they surf the four best waves they can. They only get judged on four, and the person with the highest score wins. So they spend a lot of the contest not surfing. They're here, they're looking out at the ocean. Who can guess what they're looking at? Somebody raise your hand. Here we go. But what are they looking for out there? They're looking for a set of waves. Waves come in what they call sets, usually seven or so. And so, They've, they've done this often enough that they know what they're looking for out there, and they have to decide before a wave gets to them whether they're going to try to catch that wave or not, and they have to figure out where they want to be relative to the other guys. So once a wave shows up, like this situation here, this guy is in the perfect spot. He's going to catch the wave. This guy has to get out of his way because... This guy has priority on this wave because he's inside. This guy is definitely not surfing this wave. Maybe he surfed the wave before. Maybe it was better. I don't know. But this guy is in the perfect place at the perfect time. So my analogy with surfing is a startup business doesn't have a lot of resources, money, staff, or anything. So the best way to do a startup is you find something that is small today in terms of business and doesn't have any competition. And as that market grows, your business grows also. So in 1994, this is what the internet looked like. Nobody thought the internet was going to be anything important. All we did was send uh, research proposals around from university to university on it. That's about all you could do. And so the founders of Netscape, they thought, hey, there's going to be something here. We worked on it. We spent a lot of money. And in 1995, here we were at the right place at the right time in this huge wave. And so 
My last slide, well, one point I'd like to make, now let me do this one first, I'll come back, is there are a lot of these waves going at any time, and they're here in Missouri as much as they are anywhere else in the world. These are global waves, like the CRISPR talk from last night. We're doing that here, we're doing it in pigs, we're doing it in crops, we're as good as anyone else on that. So the trick is finding the right small niche market that's small today, and then uh, growing with that market and choosing wisely. But there are a ton of opportunities all around us. And the punchline I'd like to say is a lot of this isn't about buildings, it's about people. It's about having surfers who are out there looking for waves, catching the waves, and have trained to catch waves. So our job at the incubator is to kind of help teach people how to surf. And so if you have an idea or know someone has an idea and you want to see if you can start a business with it, come over for surfing lessons and we'll, we'll do surfing lessons at the incubator. Uh, so that's pretty much my prepared remarks. You have a, um, a time available to actually uh, continue on when you, when you yeah, I'm, and then open up things for questions. Uh, I like it to be interactive, so people have questions or want to disagree or whatever. Peter. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a hard problem. Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley for a lot of reasons. And it's sort of self-perpetuating now that, you know, there's successful companies there, so the successful people fund the next round, they give advice to the next generation and all. And so building that up from a level where we are here is harder. One thing is a uh, guy named Steve Case, the guy that started America Online, wrote a book called The Third Wave. And I, I agree with a lot of what he said. In, in the first and second wave of the internet, it was about the technology, about the internet. It was Facebook, Google, Amazon. Those kind of were in the technology centers where that technology was created. But the third wave is internet en enabling all these other things, and that's this list, where how will the internet really change education? It really hasn't much yet. Uh, how will it change finance? Um, so how will it change insurance? So a lot of the third wave companies will be started wherever that is. So. Uh, we're looking at doing an accelerator here in Columbia around the healthcare system because people would come here to be part of the healthcare system, test their uh, technology in the healthcare system, and so here's a great place to do it. St. Louis might be a great place for financial services since there's already a lot of financial service companies there. And the third wave, regulation, government regulation plays a bigger role. So anybody in medical space or uh, maybe some ag spaces, you got to know your way through the regulatory process. You can't just invent something in your garage and then sell it. So part of the answer is, according to Steve Case, things will spread around and get a little ho more homogenized on where it comes from. We still have to work on where's the money going to come from. I think one of our problems in the Midwest is there are a lot of billionaires, right here in Columbia even, but they do real estate as their primary investment vehicle, or they send their money off to New York City to have somebody there manage their money for them. We don't have the appetite for risk, or uh, the, for instance, Silicon Valley has. The guys there made their money doing this. They're happy to invest it in others and help them do it. So part of it is this culture, it's a familiarity, it's having the people 
to make the investments as well as the money to make the investments. And that's just something we keep plugging away at. Uh, you chip away, you get. What would really help us is to have a, another huge deal come out of here and convince the people on the coast that they need to come here and look for deals because, you know, a Groupon or something came out of here. Good question. We have time for a couple more problems? Sure, we have plenty of time. Um, please. Uh any comments or, or, or question? Uh, please uh, wait for the mic so we can have it on the recording and live stream. Uh, Luke, Heim. So Bill, I'm looking at your surfing analogy here and just curious, what happens when there's a wipeout? Does the incubator have lifeguards in the water? I mean, how does that play out? That gets back to risk. Uh, when, when like the VC firm that I run here or in California, for every 10 investments we do, we, we expect to lose all of our money on eight of them or so, uh, seven or eight. One will be kind of okay, and what we hope is that one of them will generate more than 10 times investment. So we try to only look at those that will do 10 times. But the reason I say that is there's an expectation that a lot of them won't make it because that's the reality. And uh, there's an acceptance of that. And so in Silicon Valley, uh, like myself, I've had huge successes like at Netscape. I've had huge failures. I raised $10 million for a startup. We had 50 employees. And one day I laid them all off, turned off the lights, and the moving vans came and got all the stuff. Um, a few months later, I was out raising money again, and the same investors who had invested in my first company, some of them invested in my second company, because they didn't take it personally. They knew there was a risk. That one didn't work out. So... Uh, but it didn't, it didn't make it any less hard for me to lay off people and you know, call all the investors and say, hey, I lost all your money. Um, but it's, it's the acceptance that when you try really hard things, if it's really hard, you may not do it. And the, the investors are smart enough to know that's the risk they're taking. So. One of the guys that invested in my first round of companies was a guy named Ron Conway. He runs Silicon Valley Angels. He, I don't know how much, how big his fund was. He invested in about 300 companies in one of his funds. And I think 298 of them, it was during the internet bubble bursting, 298 of them failed. One of them was named Google. And he probably made a thousand times his money on Google. And because of that one investment, the whole thing was successful. And my friend Ron is a billionaire now. Uh, so so it's, it's a matter of accepting that hard things are hard. I don't know if that's a good enough answer, Luke, but um, the, the alternative is you do the real estate investments and you don't make 10 times your money, but your chance of losing your money is much lower. And that's where a lot of the investors around here kind of cluster, for better or for worse. Uh, Bill, I, I, we heard this morning about the, and last night, about the fact that the research triangle has got this critical mass that we don't. Yeah. When we looked at what's happening here, we've talked about Stowers and Danforth and Wash U and us, and it seems to me that one of the infrastructure investments that we need, and we've heard it talked about a little bit, is some sort of super fast connector, high speed rail, you name it, so that these three places across the state can can be within minutes of one another. So is, the, is that a priority? Because if, if, if we're gonna, we are in the flyover zone, and if so, if we're gonna get this critical mass in a way that can connect physically easily, we're gonna have to get across the state yeah. Keep fast. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I'm working on the Hyperloop. I think it's the solution. Uh, the guys at Hyperloop call it radically efficient. So you've got this 
magnetically levitated train inside of a vacuum. And once you get it rolling, it just kind of keeps going. There's no friction. So the energy costs, uh, they're saying that the ticket price from St. Louis to Kansas City would be bus fare, it would be $30. But you get there in a half hour. That'll induce demand, as that's the economic term of, say you live in St. Louis and you want to watch a football game. That's currently hard to do in St. Louis, so maybe you could spend $30, 30 minutes, and watch the Chiefs play and then come back home the same night. That, that's something you couldn't dream of doing today. Chiefs are actually getting pretty good, too. So, uh, But I think that's a piece of it. Uh, the other piece is there's quite a bit of money in the state, particularly in St. Louis and Kansas City. And we have these regional sort of factions where they want to keep their money in their own city. And so part of what I'm working on is trying to get both sides to think of Columbia as a suburb. And so that we then have access to the St. Louis and Kansas City resources. They can still fight if they want. Although I would love to see the whole region unite and, and be a single force and collaborate more. I'm all, I'm all about collaboration and working together. So one of my goals, I'm actually part, I'm, I got a job at the university last year. And one of my roles is to just get all the colleges to work together more, do joint proposals, uh, collaborate more. That's the culture in Silicon Valley. It's how can we partner together instead of how can I do something and keep you from doing it? Good question. Couple more. Brian, did you have a question? <laughs> this one's a question I think that might be unique to you, but I'm curious when you, um, in the incubator, you have a technology and you know informational technology and other startups there and you also have startups that are in the life science um, how do you kind of give advice to the MIC to kind of related but still kind of different type of industries um, within the same group and how do you rate relate with the different uh, you know startup groups yeah. yeah so to rephrase that uh, you know I'm not an expert in many things I do know a lot about the internet but I have life science companies, energy companies. How can I help those? So I'll tell you a story. When I, I came in and I interviewed for the job in 2014, the CEO of one of our life science companies, it wasn't Brian, it was someone else, somebody who moved here from Research Triangle, he raised his hand and said, how can you ever help my company because you don't understand what I do? I said, well, I have these general business skills. I know how to raise money. I know you know, how to structure companies legally and all that. And I think that particular guy was not really satisfied with that answer, but I got hired anyway. I'm now on the board of directors of that company, and I think I've, I've more than earned my respect from him in terms of board, board member issues he's had, company structures issues he's had, and invest, problems with investors that he's had. Um, and those are skills that are transferable kind of across any technology area. Um, and I think he's pretty glad I was here to help him on all of those things. And, and that's kind of the way the VCs work in California. They're not experts at anything else, anything either. Uh, but they know a lot of people and they can always bring an expert in for a particular thing. And so the culture there is They'll do favors for people, those people do favors back. And so the va there's a network effect of the more people you know, then whenever something comes along, you'll have somebody that you know you could bring in to help. And that's where a lot of the value comes from. Uh, and that's part of what I try to build here. Is I, I've been here four years now, I bet I know a thousand people in Columbia, because it's my, it's my job to build a network and add value by introducing some people to other people. So somehow you guys got introduced to Steve Trampy, uh, and that was, I think, through a class at the incubator that Quentin and Jake taught. And so it, was, it seemed kind of like random happenstance, but 
a lot of times that's, that's a big factor for companies, is meeting the right person at the right time. So Steve Trampy was their lead investor from St. Louis. And uh, yeah, so you never know who it is or what it is or the, what seems to be a random occurrence could be a big deal. I've learned to trust that. One more, two more? Sure, we have a, a little extra time. So if there's a, any... Uh, 2.30 speaker was... Yeah, unfortunately I have to announce our, our 2.30 speaker, Matt Wood from SCD Probiotics, uh, was unable to come due to some circumstances that have arisen. So we uh, will continue with our discussion. We might take a little bit of break before the three o'clock uh, panel, but we can continue the discussion. So please. Okay. Oh, Peter. If you were uh, a young person just starting at Mizzou, which you were once, and you saw this presentation on that list, which one would you be most excited about? You know, I like them all. Uh, you know, that I, now that I'm working with tech transfer and all, I'm looking for big stuff. So I think therapeutics is an area that's big. Uh, bioinformatics is big. Precision medicine is big. I mean, there's a lot of, lot of stuff on here. Uh, plant, plant and food technology. You know, where all that CRISPR stuff last night is headed, there's a lot going on there. So it's hard to say. Video games isn't on here. I kind of like that one. I, met, I talked to two video game companies this morning. Uh, but a lot of this, I also, this wasn't a random list. This is a list of stuff that I think the University of Missouri has strengths in it, everything I put up here. I didn't just make the list up. It's stuff that actually is in Missouri. We have credible people, some of which are in the room here, doing innovative things. So any one of these could be a billion dollar company. And so one last thing, don't think it couldn't be you. I'm from Bowling Green, Missouri. Uh, I went to you know University of Missouri. All I have is a well for a while. All I have is a bachelor's degree. Then I got an MBA. But if I can do it, certainly you can do it. You just have to. It's harder. It's it's not. It's not easy. It's a hard, and you may fail. The way I get through that is I always ask myself, what is the worst thing that could happen? So. At one point, I had my job at Texas Instruments. I had an idea for a company, and I kind of struggled with, well, do I quit my job when I do the company or not? And I started asking myself, what's the worst thing that could happen? And what I, my answer for myself was, I could, I could spend some of my savings account, and then I'd have to go get a job. How bad is that? And I decided that wasn't that bad. I could take that risk and then you know, maybe the upside would be good. And so it turns out the program I wrote at that time was one of the first Windows apps when Windows came out. And so a company in California bought it for $6 million. So it worked. Now, I was incredibly lucky at the timing and meeting the random person. And that was all in that company and every company I've ever done. But uh, I did stare down what was the worst that could happen, and it, it didn't scare me that much, so then I did it. So, and a lot of you, you know, you could probably keep your day job as a faculty person, um, bring somebody in to help you start the company, and it wouldn't, you wouldn't even have to quit your job. Could try some of this, maybe. So if you got any great ideas, write your disclosure, bring it to Sam, and we can help you figure out how to defend it from a patent point of view. We can help you find other people to work with you. 
We can help find either grant money or private equity, and we're here to help. Okay. Uh, okay. One last. Any final questions or, or discussion? Because we uh, have a few minutes. Oh, recognize the gentleman in the back. <laughs> Hello, Brian. This one's related to a previous question, but when you you as your your job, you kind of see um, innovation in a lot of different areas. Where do you feel like there is a lot of innovation? in the University of Missouri, but there's not a lot of entrepreneurship coming out of it. Which area do you see is like a hotbed um, within all these different areas that you feel like there should be more startups that there is not today? I don't know if that's a fair question for me because I, I don't know. I don't know that many people. Um, I can say uh, in the medical school, I assume there's a lot of really great stuff going on compared to the amounts of patents that I know we've got. In ag, plant science, I know there's a lot more innovation going on than what I see we have patents for. So my theory is we, we just haven't had, done a good enough job of going out and getting to know the faculty, finding out what they're doing, and extending the, extending the arm to help. But I don't want to pick on anybody. I constantly am amazed. Of, every time I see something new that's really cool, I go, man, I didn't know that was here. And I, there's got to be a lot more of it out there. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you so much, Bill.